Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, to everyone, wherever you may be, somewhere in this lovely world. Um, thanks so much for joining us here live today for serverless office hours. We are streaming on the AWS Twitch channel, so if you're joining us from there, thank you very much. And if you're joining us via YouTube on Serverless Land, uh, hello from you too, and also via LinkedIn Live. Uh, my name is Julian Wood. I am a developer advocate within the, within the serverless team, and I'm super happy to be joined by one of our cool product managers from the Lambda side, uh, Matthew Grasmick. Lambda, uh, Lambda, Matthew, <laughs> welcome to Serverless Office House. How are you, and how have you managed landing up working in Lambda, and you know where have you come from to join us in AWS. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm doing good. I'm excited to be here. It's my first serverless office hours. We'll um, treat you nicely. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fun topic. I love the enthusiasm you're bringing already. We got the countdown oh. and the great music and enthusiastic hosts. Um, yeah, I'll give like a quick little history of myself, um, which actually starts uh, before AWS. I've, I've only been at AWS for about um, seven months. Uh, but before that, I spent uh, 10 years uh, starting out as a developer um, and then consultant and architect, product manager, et cetera, mostly doing open source development. Um, that's where I started to get my teeth in and largely with a, a PHP background, um, working a lot in the Drupal community and actually um, from a product perspective, I used to head up uh, my former company's official you know, paid open source contribution uh, and developer experience. So it's um, those things are hold a special place in my heart. Uh, but seven months ago, I moved over to AWS, uh, became a technical product manager um, for Lambda. And I uh, one of the first things I did was take over response streaming. Um, I didn't start it. I inherited it. So I got to give a lot of credit to former PMs and lots of engineers and people that put work into this. But I did have the honor of uh, launching it. And uh, that's what we're talking about today. Cool. Yeah, excellent. Well, we will be uh, certainly coming back to uh, Lambda Response Streaming, but just having a quick look uh, back on the last week of what's happened in the world of serverless. Last week's stream, uh, some of the different worlds collided. Who would have thought it? Event-driven architectures and Kubernetes joined forces. So the previous week uh, on the 18th of April, we had some product managers and uh, software development engineers uh, talking about how you can actually manage event bridge with Kubernetes. So this is using the Kubernetes API with the K Kubernetes command line tools, and you'll be able to create event uh, bridge bus and schedules and do things like that. Really cool, um, really cool stream. It's available, the recording's available on youtube.com slash serverless land, as with all our other serverless land, um, serverless office hours content. So yeah, this was actually really interesting, just showing how you know people who want to use the Kubernetes API and standardize on that, but you can still use your serverless applications and still uh, not have to sort of choose, choose between using you know AWS CLI for managing things and just standardizing Kubernetes uh, API. It was really a sort of light bulb going off moments about thinking what the possibility is. In terms of what's new with uh, AWS looking over the, the, the past uh, few weeks, um, well, other than Lambda response streaming, which seems, I think it was three weeks ago now, which seems uh, seems ages in the big scheme of things. Uh, but yeah, the Python 3.10 runtime is now available in Lambda. So I know it's been a long time coming and people have been asking. Uh, but just to let you know some of the secret sauce uh, underneath the hood, we know we, we know we were super late, but there's a lot of work that's been going on under the, under the scenes to do some decoupling, as we like to do with serverless, uh, with all good architecture practices. And that's certainly um, going to help be, us being able to push out runtimes more uh, more often and more timely. And actually, so 3.10 has come out as a managed runtime. Uh, uh, but actually, the 3.11 um, container image is also out for Python. So that's actually available. And so we're sort of using that as a bit of a test, a bit of a beta to make sure the 3.11 is going to work when that officially then uh, comes out a little uh, little bit later. Um, Guard duty support, that's also interesting. If you have your security hat on and you're wanting to do some code analysis, uh, Guard duty support for Lambda is going to be really cool. And also the top one, you know, Sam CLI for testing support for API Gateway Lambda authorizers. You know, that has been a, a, a good request. And I'm so happy to see that, that, that coming out. Certainly going to be, be able to make your Sam, local development experience, that's just a little bit, little bit easier. Then in terms of the uh, compute blog posts, well, some of the compute blog posts are to support some of those launches. So uh, things like response streaming and the Python 3 to end runtime. Uh, the serverless, in case you missed it, post, I wrote that. And that's literally looking back over the first quarter of 2023 and seeing all the, not just the announcements and releases, but contents out there and the other you know videos and blog posts and uh, patterns and talks that are online. So yeah, that's a really great resource to be able to catch up about all the different things that are going on in the serverless world at AWS. And also techniques to reduce Lambda costs. We all want to do that. So Josh and Chloe have put together a blog post which came out yesterday, just helping you with some uh, 
good, quick, and useful uh, tips and tricks to be able to understand and uh, improve your uh, costs. Now, something new that's coming up on May the 17th. So uh, this is called the AWS Serverless Innovation Day 2023. And this is going to be a live stream uh, for a full day on the 17th, talking all things serverless. And it's going to be um, things to do with event-driven architectures. It's going to be uh, serverless containers. And it's going to be serverless compute with Lambda. And we're going to have from our VP of serverless compute, Holly Mezrobian, who you've probably heard speak at reInvent before. She's going to be talking about a whole uh, bunch of things we're working on and how she thinks about serverless compute. Um, I'm going to be talking, doing a talk about Lambda. We've got other people in my team talking about uh, even different things for Lambda streaming and event-driven architectures. And uh, some of our container developer advocates are going to be talking about that. So this is really going to be useful. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be a super cool day. We're all working on our demos to make it as useful and interesting as possible. So the QR code and the short link, s12d.com, will take you to the registration page. And we would absolutely love to see you. So this week, we are talking about Lambda response streaming. So that's, uh, that's come out. I um, Matthew, uh, as he says, has done a whole bunch of work on the product management side. And I've done some work on creating some demos for it. So we sort of we're not we're sort of uh, hosting and guesting each other really on this one. We don't have someone external, so we're going to be you know sending sending our um, questioning each other and doing this as best we can. <clears throat> but um, just so you know, of course, we are live here on Office Hours, so you know please send us your questions and your comments via the chat on whichever platform you're doing. Uh, we'll bring them up on the screen and we can uh, answer your questions uh, and everything. And I suppose it is really good for Mookie Monkey, who's joining us via Twitch, to say Lambda is beast. So thank you very, uh, thank you very much for that. But yeah, please send your questions and comments or anything to do with what we're talking about today or serverless uh, in general. So uh, Matthew, uh, tell us about response streaming. Why did we build response streaming, and what is it for? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. So I think um, there's two main problems that response streaming sets out to solve. And so we've got them up here on this slide. Problem number one is really about faster time to first byte. So with uh, a non-streamed response, which we call a buffered response, you have to wait for the whole response to be ready. So um, for instance, if you're building like a big JSON blob or you're returning a whole bunch of markup or processing a video, you do the whole thing, and when you're ready, you send the whole packet back um, to the client. And that usually means a user waiting on the other end. And that doesn't feel like a very snappy experience. It slows down the time to first byte, which is an important performance metric that really gets at like if a person feels like it's fast or not. Mm -hmm. um, with response streaming, instead of um, waiting for that response to buffer, you can send a partial response back. So faster time to first byte helps with that. Second problem is um, many of you may be aware that with the buffered response, there is a six megabyte or mebibyte is the, uh, the correct way to pronounce that particular suffix, um, payload limit. So your response can only be that size. Um, and that's partly because we have to hold that response in memory, maybe for a long time before we send it back. So it's a limitation. And that's something that can change now too, since we're kind of flushing the buffer and sending the response back instead of holding it in memory. So we can take a look at the next slide. Um, some of what I already said, I think. But you know, the ways that this that response streaming solves this is, um, you know, for one, for that time to first byte, there's a different invocation pattern now. So the the function on the Lambda side is going to be sending data back uh, as soon as it has one thing right to send back. It doesn't have to have the whole response, it can have a partial response. And that's really up to you as the developer, what you're sending back and how you want to split it up into payloads that are streamed back. Um, there's a lot of good like native support for this in some runtimes like in Node.js, you know, there's built-in stream libraries, there's frameworks like Next.js that support this natively. So lots of examples of that. But of course, um, your end user sees something much faster, even if they don't see the whole thing. Um, and you know, by by the same token, we're able to give you a larger payload because you're you're flushing that buffer and sending it back to the client sooner. Um, for now, we're raising that six megabyte payload from uh, six to twenty, but it's a soft limit, so you can submit a request through the uh, support console and ask for a higher limit, and you know we can accommodate that within reason. <laughs> All right, so let me give you some examples um, of how you could actually use this in real life, real life use cases. Um, the first one is sort of, uh, this is the zeitgeist right now, right? Generative AI is bedrock, ChatGPT, 
So just a fun example, this is, you know, I was playing with um, generative AIs a lot just over this weekend and me understanding the use cases. But, you know, when I call out to these AIs, whether it's on a mobile app or whether I'm going through the API, I notice you get the response back kind of line by line, right? The text doesn't all come back to you at once. You can kind of see the AI thinking um, and sending you that gradually. And if you were to use a Lambda function to call that uh, generative AI, you could stream that response back to your client as soon as you get it from that upstream API. So that's a good example instead of waiting for the whole thing to finish. Um, Server-side rendering is another good example. So Next.js I mentioned, but you know a lot of times with Next.js or other front-end frameworks, you kind of mix what gets rendered in the client versus what gets rendered upstream. And you don't have to wait for whatever the upstream thing is. So for instance, if I wanna show my profile page uh, on a Next.js application, that's dynamic, right? I'm not gonna cache that statically in a CDN. I need to kind of calculate that markup. Well, now if I use response streaming and I do this on a Lambda function, I can start to get that HTML back uh, faster and start rendering the page immediately for the end user. A couple other examples, um, larger responses. And again, like this is for dynamic payload. So maybe it wouldn't make sense if you had a big PDF you generated once and just stuck on the internet and went there for all time. But if you're actually generating the PDF, or an image or uh, an archive based on user input or based on you know, some kind of personalization for the particular user. And you're, you're kind of doing it on the fly. You can start streaming it back before you're even done. Um, and this also makes sense for, for real-time experiences like playing a video or an audio stream. Maybe you're stitching in an advertisement um, into that in real time and streaming it back so nobody has to wait. Yeah, and one of the interesting things I think also with uh, specifically with the way node streaming works is something like the larger payloads. Sure, if you're going to be generating your own PDF, but also if you are going to be you know pulling data from somewhere else and you don't mm -hmm. necessarily know beforehand how big that data is going to be, you know, it's from a third party API or some other kind of thing. <clears throat> and um, so, yeah, you'd be able to, you know, not have to have that decision point of, well, I don't know yet if it's going to be between, you know, before or over six meg. Um, it just simplifies one of your decisions with Lambda. And then, yeah, you could pull something in from something else, literally stream it in memory through the Lambda function uh, and back out through the front door, um, which, yeah, is just a, a really easy way to do that. And we'll sh show how that, how, how that works. Yep. And I think we've got, we don't have too many slides. There's going to be a lot of conversation. <laughs> there are a couple more. I want to talk about just like the, little context about where you can use this now um, versus where you can use it in the future. So right now we've released um, runtime support for Node.js 14, 16, and 18. And what that means is when you're writing a Lambda function and the function runs in a Node.js runtime, that function can stream. And it's important to think about this, like you've kind of got the, the function and you've got the, the thing uh, invoking the function and both of them have to be trying to stream for them to kind of meet in the middle and, and make that streaming connection. So right out of the box, it works with Node.js. Um, the way it works with Node.js is actually by leveraging the fact that um, we support this in our custom runtime API. So if you have a custom runtime, um, you're able to implement this. And actually just in the couple of weeks we've been live, we've seen people do this already with Python and with Go in their own um, custom runtimes. Uh, and by the same token, if you're using Lambda Web Adapter, which actually has a custom, it is a custom runtime and an extension, um, it'll work with any uh, language in there. And so I, I should take a second, I'll, I'll try not to go off too much on a tangent, but I know some people might not know what Lambda Web Adapter is, so I should explain that. Um, Lambda Web Adapter is pretty cool. Basically, if you've got something that's like a web application, so it's some software that listens for a connection on a port. Um, so that could be Node.js, it could be PHP, it could be Python or something else. Yeah, so even like it, Express or Flask or, you know, these exactly. well, well used um, frameworks. Yeah. yeah, the kind of thing you drop on a web server instead of something that, you know, in Lambda, you usually think of it like a handler wrapping a function, right? <laughs> um, if you have, if you use Lambda Web Adapter, which you can just add as a layer to your Lambda function, you can just drop that, um, you know, Flask or Express code in place and uh, Lambda Web Adapter does the job of translating the invoke event into what looks like an HTTP request for your code. Um, so what's cool about this is you could have something already written. You didn't write it for Lambda. You drop it into a Lambda function, add this layer, 
and right now you can you can stream responses in Node.js. It already works in Python, and I think it's going to be a pretty fast follow to get support for other runtimes with Lambda Web Adapter because it's kind of doing this magic of, of using the custom runtime API anyway. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, lastly, you know, on the rather than the runtime side, the function side, on the invoker side, um, whatever happens to be calling it, you know, we have various SDKs, Java SDKs, JavaScript, Go, et cetera. So we've got um, built in uh, invocation support in those SDKs. But if you need something different, you can also just hit the Lambda API directly. There's a new API endpoint um, that streams the response back. And this is also integrated with function URL. So if you are making an HTTP request to a function URL, uh, there's a new configuration for function URL. So you can just say, yep, stream this response. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to use an SDK from AWS. You can just use an HTTP SDK and just make a call with an HTTP, HTTP client. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the quick landscape of sort of what's supported and where you might need to do a little extra work, but um, it is, it's GA now and ready to go. And we're, yeah. and we're excited to see the response in the community. Yeah, no, that's good. And it really sort of also helped, I think, just to to circle back on the function URL uh, functionality, you know, when, when that came out, it was like, okay, well, it's really good for building, you know, a lot of internal microservices. But now, you know, with, with the function URL being so tightly bound to Lambda, you know, it's not an additional charge, doesn't cost you anything extra to use a function URL. You know, this really does make it, you know, really super simple just to be able to stream web content or whatever kind of content directly from Lambda and sort of have Lambda as a little, you know, little microservice as a, as a, as a web service, um, uh, which is good. Um, so Alpacode, thanks again for joining us via Twitch. How does it help to stream a partially generated PDF? I think uh, either myself or Matthew maybe have uh, misspoke. It's not necessarily a partially generated PDF, but a, you know, a PDF that you've created yourself. So if you had a static PDF, you would probably just store it on S3, maybe with a pre-signed URL. But um, uh, you, um, if you had a partially, if you had a, if you had a, a PDF that you custom generated, I mean, in a way, technically you can sort of stream that across. So I, I don't think any, I, I can't think of anything on the client side that would, you know, would, would put together a, a, you know, a streamed PDF as it arrived. I don't think Matthew, but uh, if you get the, yeah, I don't think that would, that would happen, but um, yeah, it's more from generating your own PDFs, uh, send, uh, sending that via using the larger function, the larger payload size to be able to send that through. Yeah, and the, it's the content type is whatever you want to stream back. Like you, you can stream back a binary file, and as long as the thing on the other side can understand the data that you're sending back, that's the limit, right? So like the the highway is open for sending things um, from the function to the client. Um, I'll let you pull up the next question. That was cool how it, how it popped up on the screen. <laughs> yeah. And then um, yeah, uh, Mookie Monkey again. Hi. Uh, how does it stream if it's using HTTP and not WebSockets? HTTP can do this. I mean, I, yeah. I did it. Like, I do I really know what's happening at the protocol level to make it possible? No. But like when I was testing this before we even released it, you know, I've got on the command line, I use curl or I use um, HTTP, which is, you know, like an OSX, nice CLI tool for it. And, you know, you pass like a parameter dash dash stream to curl or to these other libraries. And they're using the HTTPS protocol and, you know, they, they stream across it. So it does not require um, a WebSocket. Yeah. And then just, uh, you know, some people have been asking about well, why only sort of node support and, you know, when are the others coming and, <clears throat> and what's happening? So just to sort of address, address that, this has been this has been built as part of the Lambda API with a new API. So it isn't built specifically just for Node, but Node's got really good streaming support. And so that's the sort of first one to try and you know get working and make sure we're doing all the all the right kind of things. Um, as Matthew said, it's also supported by a custom runtime. So then you can sort of see um, uh, you know you can sort of see that um, it's available for everything, but you know, we starting small and hopefully going to expand in the future. And we'd love to hear, you know, use cases or ways we can uh, construct, the, you know, whether that's going to be decorators or with other kind of things, you know, happy to take feedback on that. So no, we're not creating, we're not, no, we're not starting to create specific Lambda features for specific uh, languages where we, where we, where we can. Um, but, you know, this is just, uh, Node was just so much easier to start with. And so, yeah, we're happy to take feedback and, and, and want to carry that on. Yeah, I mean, we're we're waiting for people in, in a way to tell us like what the next runtime is that's yeah. most important to them. We definitely listen and track um, feedback and requests for, for mm -hmm. product features. Um, we could have waited to release this until we built it into every runtime, but we thought it'd be better to 
get it out the door, like let people start using it. And um, the custom runtime support is like a nice way to make sure that even if it requires a little extra effort, you're not blocked. You can really use any runtime that you want right now. Um, but Node.js is where it's uh, the lowest effort and built yeah. in out of the box. And then actually a good question, which I was going to cover that tone dev guy. Nice handle. Does streaming require you to pass API gateway due to 30 second timeouts? So it's definitely worth talking about API gateway and or, um, also application load balancer because they, they are triggers for Lambda. Um, API gateway does not support streaming going through API gateway. And so you were not able to stream a response directly from API Gateway, hence the advice to use the function URLs. However, with API Gateway, you can use the um, larger payload size um, larger than Lambda. So Lambda's payload limit is 6 meg. API Gateways is 10 meg. So if you do have PDFs between 6 and 10 meg, you would be able to stream that larger payload um, from a function URL through to an API gateway. So this isn't using API Gateway's Lambda integration, it's using an HTTP proxy integration, but that does definitely work. You obviously got to get your IAM uh, uh, permissions between the two, but yes, that, that, that certainly does work. Uh, so it, um, that also means API Gateway's 29 or 30 second timeout is still all in place as normal API Gateway. And if you think of it, API Gateway is actually streaming it from the HG, the, from, via the function URL and then buffering it as part of API Gateway and then sending that onto you uh, in your, uh, from wherever you're calling that. Is that all correct, Matthew? I haven't messed anything up. because yep, I, that's all correct. <clears throat> and then the application load balancer, that does not support streaming. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to use uh, um, ALBs with uh, Lambda function URLs. Yeah, um, but it, it's it's not just. I just sorry to interrupt. Um, please do. Yeah, you can use function URLs instead, but remember, you can also use the Lambda API directly, which yeah. is a really popular <laughs> choice, um, and we see yeah. a lot of adoption from that already. So that's an alternative to function URLs if, for some reason, uh, that's not the way you wanted to go. Yeah, definitely. So, and especially, you know, in fact, I've I've got a demo. I'll show the SDK calls, and that's super useful because you can, you know, do mid. You can even show there's a good demo which I'll I'll, I'll link to. You can show, you know, midstream errors and you know the beginning and the end and all that kind of thing. So yeah, if you are uh, doing things uh, that you can use the S SDK, you know, that's really that's actually going to be really easy. Um, <clears throat> Dan MBA, thanks for joining us via Twitch. Streams are part of the HTTP three spec, also known as Quick. Yeah, Matthew, I'm not quite sure if that's applicable here, or I see you, to you don't have to use HTTP yeah. three to stream the response. You can go over one or two, and, and it also works. Absolutely. Although yeah. maybe maybe it's not part of the spec officially, and it kind of got more official in HTTP three. Um, and I also see um, Mookie Monkey asked if uh, is a follow up to. And it returns the full response. Well, it eventually returns the full response. At yeah. first, it returns the partial response. You can and you can kind of see it coming in. Um, and when it finishes with the response, then you have the full response. Um, and again, it's up to you. You know, if it's just text that a user is reading, you can send that over. There's no need to parse it. It doesn't have to be structured. Um, or you might be sending something where you actually want to capture it and render it in some particular way. It's really up to you yeah. what you're sending back and how you want to. What you want to do with it on the client yeah. side, and what your yeah, what your client can actually support. You know, that's also got to be able to. If it needs to just stitch things together, you know, something needs to happen. So maybe we should do a demo. Uh, anybody keen on doing a demo um, or seeing a demo? Let's see how some of this is going to work. <laughs> so um, let's see. I have a um, couple of different Lambda functions over here. They're all deployed with Sam. Just so we're not waiting for Sam deploy to happen, but you know, to be honest, it's not going. It's not particularly. Uh, it's not particularly complicated. So first of all, just to look at the Sam and the CloudFormation config, I have a function URL, and this is the new invoke mode, which now has a response stream rather than the default invoke mode, which is a buffered response. So if you are doing this via function URLs in your CloudFormation slash Sam, you can just set the invoke mode to response stream. And like all good security people, I've also set the auth type to AWS IAM. So I'm not just opening this function URL um, over to the internet, even though I'm sure you lovely people won't uh, want to DDoS my accounts. But um, I'll actually show you I have some protection features in. Um, so that shouldn't be a problem. But that said, I've just got you know, a normal Node.js runtime, you know, a time out of 30 seconds, memory size of 512. So this is just a you know, normal Lambda function. And then this is what the new um, decorator looks like, the new sort of wrapper of the, when you 
doing streaming. So you've got your normal exports.handler, handler, and we do have this AWS Lambda.streamify response. So we then uh, wrap this normal uh, you know, async event, and you can see here we now have this new uh, response stream. So the response stream is then uh, created, and we're just going to uh, you know add some metadata. So you know I could uh, you know give my content type. I'm going to be sending some HTML in this example, but it could also be uh, you know any any you know a PDF or a JSON or that kind of thing, whatever you want. And then of course you can add any custom headers you may you may need. Then what the code is going to do is I'm going to basically. Uh, you know, create this uh, response stream, and this is the, the two different ways that I'm going to then have an opportunity to write to this response stream. The first one, which is which is quite simple, but does have a, a limitation, which I'll mention, is where you just write to this response stream. So I've got text, and I'm going to simply write to this response stream. So let's actually just look at. This looks like I'm going to change directory into this folder. I have already deployed this, so I just had, do have a function URL, which is in my CloudFormation outputs. And I'm going to just use a standard curl, and I am going to um, <clears throat> read that. Now, before I actually run the curl, <clears throat> run the curl I'm actually going to pick up two things. First of all, I'm going to let you know when I'm going to um, uh, hit enter, so you can actually watch the stream come through. Because if you you know if you do blink too long or look away or drinking your coffee, you're going to miss it, and then you will sort of <clears throat> miss the output. So I've done a normal uh, a normal get to the Lambda function URL. Real. And what I've actually done is, I don't know if you're aware of this, and I thought I'd bring it up, is to be able to use a, a user access and key with AWS SIG v4 signing directly from curl. You do need to specify the actual Lambda service, which I'm specifying over here. But this is something I only realized when I started working on this, that you can actually use curl uh, with an AWS IAM authorization. And I do have a username and a secret access key. Now, I have also created an IAM policy, a resource policy, for this function URL that you can only, uh, and I have a specific user for this. So this isn't my user in my admin account. This is you know as locked down as it possibly can. And literally all it can do is it can invoke this function URL. So yeah, you can maybe slightly DDoS me at the moment, but as soon as the stream is over, I will uh, be disabling this. Um, I'll be disabling this. And also, you know, Lambda concurrency controls are also going to kick in. So there's a bit of protection there uh, if things are going to go wildly wrong. But so <clears throat> watch the screen and you'll be able to see I have some HTML that is going to be streaming. We've got first write, and this is literally coming directly from the Lambda function. I'm going to run that again, and you can see there is no buffered response coming all. It's some glorious la uh, Latin, um, way too many years after any Latin classes I may have done to remember what that is saying. But here we go. So you can immediately see that first write. If you had a uh, you know a single page, uh, if you had a micro front end in your web application, you know there's a whole bunch of uh, content that you can immediately give to your front ends, and then you know wait maybe for something uh, something further to appear. So there we go. That literally um, uh, shows how you can use the um, how you can write to the stream using a write. Now I did mention that the write has some caveats. Well. The write is a bit of a basic Node.js construct where it's just going to write to the stream and you know write as fast as you can as you can send it. But obviously there could be payloads that could be uh, bigger than normal, and you could basically overwrite the Lambda uh, stream with whatever you're trying to send to it. So there is an improved way to do that, and I'm going to look at this other um, <coughs> Lambda function which basically uses a uh, pipeline. So uh, this is now using the uh, uh, using Node. I'm importing the, the stream, and I'm sort of generating this pipeline uh, with a with a promise that I'm going to basically uh, send the stream to this pipeline. Again, I've got the normal AWS Lambda Streamify response, well, the normal for this uh, for the for the streaming, and uh, the same response stream which I'm going to do. And so in this example, <clears throat> what this is actually going to do is it's just going to output this little. Um, uh, shipping thing with text, and you can see I've iterated, you know, one or two four by one or two four times. And if you're watching, you know, that is actually streaming down the screen, and that's that's going to be doing it. So this is a way if you're going to, have, you know, uh, larger payloads or things you're not entirely going to be uh, entirely going to be sh um, sure of. Pipeline is a much safer way that you're not going to be able to um, overload the stream that you're going to be sending to Lambda, and just makes it a bit more of a uh, robust solution. And you know has some uh, buffering built in, and so it can handle that, and and, and is a cleaner way to do it. Uh, Matthew, do you have anything to add from the sort of the, the pipeline and the buffering, and you know better explanations yeah. than, than I? Yeah, think? there's something I can add. I hope I get it right because it's something I had to learn as I <laughs> took over yeah. this particular feature. Um, 
So there is something called back pressure, um, yeah. which is a mechanism that's built in uh, to Node.js by default. We had to make sure that it, we, we built it in to our implementation of it for Node.js, where uh, if the client is not able to consume the streamed content at the same rate that the producer is producing, uh, if you don't have back pressure support, uh, you could kind of have this ballooning effect where the buffer, the, the um, response starts to build in size and memory. You can kind of think of like a balloon, like filling with water because it's like, you know, a hose yeah. attached to it isn't letting the water out. Um, so when you use pipeline here, as you did in this example, back pressure support is taken care of for you. We use the built-in node back pressure support. So it's not something you need to worry about. And so that's a reason we actually recommend um, that you should use the pipeline method um, most of the time, rather than just the right method, because you just get some of that Node.js built-in goodness to make sure that that kind of me like running out of memory scenario of with that ballooning response could not happen to you. Um, I, and I can quickly answer one question that's in here. Where's AWS Lambda defined yes. slash supported? <clears throat> um, you're so quick with that. So I start talking about a question that's on the screen. Um, that's just there. That's part of the manage Node.js runtime. So if you select the 14 or 16 or 18 manage Lambda Node.js runtime and you just write this in your function, it's already available in the environment for you. You don't have to import it. Yeah, so we've you know included this as part of the node managed uh, uh, runtime. So yeah, this isn't another dependency you need to add or anything. It's just part of Lambda, which is cool. Uh, oh, Eric Johnson is joining us saying, hi, response streaming from an AWS Lambda function. Oh, Chris Munns will be happy, uh, unhappy without the function. Come on, that's cool. Uh, Eric, so cool that you can join us. Uh, hi, how are you? <clears throat> So we've looked at the right, <clears throat> we've looked uh, at the pipeline. The other one use case is to then start looking at the, uh, the large payloads. So we have spoken about the large payloads. Um, uh, not that, not that. Uh, the large payload was up over here. I do need to install CFN Lint. Uh, you know, nothing different that you're gonna that you're gonna set. Basically, I have a Lambda function over here that is going to basically read from um, our team's public assets. I've got a PDF file that is it within the public assets, and I'm just going to you know do a response stream. I'm also using IAM as well, and this is going to stream the static content from S3. Now. Unfortunately, it is just static content. I didn't have a sort of PDF to generate on the fly. Let's just have a look at the code, and we can see sort of one or two interesting things that may, may be useful. Um, again, I'm using the pipeline because that's recommended. And you know this is going to be a, a big chunk of data. We don't want uh, to have any sort of back pressure issues, uh, which is going to help. And when Matthew is talking about the back pressure issues, you know, also if there are you know maybe bizarrely some networking issues within the Lambda service as well, you know this is also going to help to mitigate uh, mitigate against that. That you know something does happen, and you're at least you're going to be able to catch up. So all I'm doing is I'm grabbing a file from S3, and um, I've got my AWS lambdas.streamify uh, response, and I've got the you know the bucket parameters. So this is just normal uh, grabbing something from S3. Again, I am just grabbing a static asset. I could have had something else that was going to maybe generate a PDF on the fly or a media file or, or something kind of uh, something kind of that. So I'm then generating the request stream. But what I'm actually doing is I'm literally streaming this directly from S3. So I'm not actually downloading the object from S3. I'm not then saving it into the temp folder or even you know, saving it as a whole thing into memory. <clears throat> I'm literally taking it from S3 and I'm streaming it through this Lambda function. And then ultimately, it's going to go out, out via the, the function URL. So this is what I was mentioning earlier. This is a sort of really interesting use case where um, you can have sort of Lambda as this transit point of being able to grab something, maybe from a third-party API, maybe from S3. Uh, maybe you are combining things from various different sources and at the Lambda function, but you don't actually necessarily have to always you know, build something, store it in temp, and then stream it out. So <clears throat> this is where also you know, node streaming uh, cleverness is able to do that. So I yeah I literally do the you know the create and that's part of the S3 API I can create a read stream to pull something different uh, directly from S3 and then I literally just await the pipeline uh, the request stream so that is the request stream that's coming from S3 and then the response stream is what I'm then sending to my caller which in this case will be a uh, function URL but you know it could also be the AWS SDK so you need to prove that it's actually working. Um, so what I'm going to do is I do have, I think I have ran this uh, a bit before, so I'm just going to remove this 
this file. So that was a PDF file. It now interesting. You, well, let me download it first, and we will show you what that looks like. So here we go. I'm curling again with the endpoint. I'm using IAM authorization, so it is secure via curl, and I'm using the with the SIGV4 signing. And I'm pulling down this file, which is a, a PDF file, and you can see that has come down. And also, what I've done at the end is I'm just looking at the content type that has come down. And you can see previously we've been talking about text with HTML and all these kind of things. Well, my content type has is now application PDF. So you know, Lambda is uh, the function URL has just dynamically realized exactly what my um, what my um, my content type is, which can be super useful. You know, your client could do different things based on the content type. So if I then look at this file, you can see that that is 11 meg or 11-ish meg. So you know that's definitely bigger than Lambda's 6 meg limit. Uh, in fact, it's definitely going to be bigger than API Gateway's uh, 10 meg limit. And so you know, a really <clears throat> simple example there of I've been able to stream from S3 and be able to write via streaming and a function URL an 11 meg file, um, you know, uh, into my client. There we go, <clears throat> large, stre uh, large streaming support. So yeah, loads of use cases for this. You know, PDFs. Um, you know, anything. And as Matthew mentioned, you know, this is up to a twenty meg soft limit. So um, you know, that twenty meg soft limit is soft. So you know, we want to, you know, find out what the use cases are going to be. And if you are interested, the soft limit is actually interestingly not necessarily on the size, but it's actually just managing the network throughput on our side. Um, so obviously, we, you know, uh, Lambda runs on uh, on a Firecracker virtual micro VM technology. You know, we can have many many uh, uh, functions running, and you know, because this is much bigger payloads, we just want to make sure that we are sort of behaving in the Lambda world and sharing nicely and managing our network throughput. So that is one of the things to uh, one of the things to, uh, to to why we've got this uh, got this limit. Uh, but yeah, any kind of large payloads, maybe you've got a big JSON uh, blob that you need to come. Uh, maybe you've got some sort of you know thing from a third-party API that's uh, you know generating some machine learning data. I know people have been compositing images and comp compositing audio from various different sources and then putting them together. And you yeah up to 20 meg uh, for now, or with a with an increase you can you can get that increased. Um, Matthew, just for the I don't believe that Lambda response streaming is is integrated yet with service quotas. So it will be a call that you need to uh, a support call you'll need to do to raise that. Yeah, a, a ticket. I mean, you don't have to talk to a person. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Some some of us don't like to do that. Yeah, um, exactly. Us IT people. <laughs> yeah, we're we're being extroverted right now. Um, you know, just as you were talking about, it, I thought of another metaphor that that might help people kind of wrap their heads around this. Something that makes sense to me is, you know, if if you've got some experience on the command line and you've just played around with piping output from one command into another. Um, you'll know that a lot of them support that kind of like streamed output. So maybe you're streaming text into a gzip uh, command and like zipping it as you're downloading it. Yeah. Or maybe you're, as you're unzipping the file, you pipe that into a SQL import um, so that you don't have to like do it procedurally. Um, this is really the same idea. And, and I guess I haven't tried it, but you could just do that with this. You could curl. And as it streams, you could pipe that into um, the next thing, assuming that you, you know, chose um, a command that actually supports that. And it's yeah. kind of the same idea. You're, you're piping together things and that kind of real-time stream of data between um, instead of waiting for the operation to complete. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think I, I think I had a working demo at one stage. I'll I'll see if I can uh, post that up of doing the streaming thing exactly. Yeah, pull something in and send it into a stream. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, stream it into a zip file as soon as it arrives, which is which is really cool. Yeah, Alpacodes, you were asking about does streaming directly from S3 reduce the Lambda memory usage and cost? <clears throat> I don't believe it's actually the memory usage, but it is the time that the function is going to work, uh, the invoke time that's going to happen. Because if you think it's sort of a, a dual process, if you if you're streaming, you you download you know 11 meg from S3, store it into your temp folder, and then you send that that 11 meg out through the function URL. In a way, you are sort of doubling your time, and being able to stream this directly. I don't think it's as quickly as just as one read, but it's not as slow as as one read plus a write. So it definitely makes your lambda function run a little uh, run a little bit quicker. Um, <clears throat> your lambda memory usage, um, I don't think it will necessarily reduce it because it's using up the same uh, lambda memory. But yeah, the cost is more, I think, um, to do with the actual I, total invocation think, time. 
this is like a it depends answer. Yeah. Sort of like, it depends on what you're doing in your function. Like you might be storing temporary data in memory yeah. um, in order to buffer a response, and now and that would be expensive because it requires yeah. it just requires more memory. That's extra memory. Right? And now you could change your implementation so that instead mm -hmm. of buffering in memory, you're streaming right away, which means you could reduce the amount of RAM that you need. Um, but only if that's what we, you were doing in the first place. Yeah. So it, it kind of depends. But I can definitely see how there, there would be use cases where you can reduce your memory usage. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then, uh, uh, Martin, thanks for joining us via Twitch. How would you solve for Lambda timeout streaming large files or slowly? So yes, maybe I haven't been uh, obvious enough, but also if you're using function URLs or you are using the Lambda API, how long does the Lambda function? How long can a Lambda function run? And that's for up to fifteen minutes. So this immediately already unlocks a huge amount of use cases where people are blocked by API gateways, 29 uh, second timeout. So already you have, you know, what, 30 times, nearly 30, well, 30 times longer to be able to stream data out of a, a Lambda function. Now, how do you solve for Lambda timeout streaming large files? Well, while your Lambda function is running, you have information to be able to, uh, you have information to be able to do this. So. <clears throat> You have the context object, which is also going to show the amount of time in milliseconds that is that is available. So that is one way that you can actually look at how much time is remaining in your Lambda function and decide what you're going to do. Uh, people have used this if, they, if they've got a whole bunch of data and they're streaming as much as they can, but that doesn't necessarily have a fixed size and they can sort of carry on where they left off with maybe some sort of checkpointing, which they can store externally. You know, the, the context object is, is what you can do. But from the streaming side, there's a lot of intelligence built in, which I'm about to show you, which shows some of the error handling that you can do within your Lambda function code, um, which uh, you can pick up via the SDK. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to switch to my um, other demo over here. And in fact, all of these demos are on serverlessland.com. I will link them directly. In fact, let me just do that while I'm here, because I will do the first one. You'll be able to find the others. <clears throat> so, you know, on serverless patterns, so uh, on, on the serverless patterns site, uh, you know, we always welcome your uh, contributions if you're going to add them. So the serverless patterns I'm just putting in the um, in the chat now, that's the first one. So that was the time to first byte, which is using the right. Then also I've got a uh, pattern which I've created, which is when we're using pipeline. I'll add them on. They will pop up on the screen. <clears throat> Sorry, this is manual scene. I'm being host and I'm being uh, uh, the interviewee, interviewer and interviewee at the You're same time. So <laughs> certainly having to multitask. <laughs> Um, the larger payloads, let's plonk that up as well. So that's the larger payload. So that is, uh, you know, streaming from S3. And then this one I'm about to do, which is invoking a function using the SDK. And we're going to be able to look at some of that error kind of stuff. So um, in the actual uh, in the actual um, stream notes on YouTube and on uh, LinkedIn and by AWS Twitch, these links are there as well. But if you're not able to see that, at least you've spotted them on the screen. So back to the demo, we now have this SDK example. So if I look at the code for the SDK function, I've got um, two parts of it. I've obviously got the, the side that's the, the Lambda function and then the SDK caller, which is the client side, which is going to be calling that Lambda function. Now, this is calling the Lambda function, but it's not via a Lambda function URLs. This is calling the Lambda API directly. So don't need function URLs. Uh, you know, Really easy use case to be able to use if you've got an application that you can just target the Lambda API. So this Lambda function, um, in fact, I've got a few different Lambda functions. And here, we've got the Lambda of the Streamify response. And this is the happy part. So you know, all this is going to doing is a whole bunch of strings. This function is streaming this response back, and now it is finished. And I'm, you know, I'm going to read in the promise, and I'm just going to um, then uh, write everything out to the um, write everything out to the front end. So, but deliberately, there are going to be no errors in this lambda function. It's all going to be fine. And then, oh, one thing I didn't mention: when you are using write, you do need to end the stream. Um, if you're using pipeline, you don't need to end the stream. So, um, something uh, something to add with that. So, I. I do then have a, another Lambda function that is another handler that's going to be invoked, which then uses the Streamify response. This has the same, you know, the same text thing, which is going to come uh, come back. But what we're going to do is 
when we get to string number four, we are going to throw an error and say, this is an error, you know, this is a custom error midstream. Now, obviously, we're just picking a, a stream thing to do a custom error. If you did have some other, you know, some other use case that something was happening further downstream or you're pulling in something from another API and something goes wrong, well, you know, within the stream, you're able to dynamically uh, handle that and uh, generate an error. And uh, yeah, you'll throw the error and we'll see what that uh, what, what happens. And I think there is an error somewhere else where there's a timeout. I think this function also generates a timeout. Uh, um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I am going to, uh, there's actually an install. So what I've actually installed from the node modules, uh, oops, something else popped on the screen. I, oh, my headset does keep, popping out, which is slightly annoying. I do have a whole bunch of things which I have installed over here. Let me just see what that was. <clears throat> so there is a, where's my package? Oh, there's my package.json. So I basically have this SDK client. So I'm using the, uh, the, the Lambda client to call the SDK. And obviously, this uh, SDK is using the V3 of the SDK. And that is updated to be able to handle streaming response. So uh, that's my code. And what I can do is I can, I've just, so I'm going to run the, my client. Where's my client? So here's my client. I'm going to be importing the Lambda client. So this isn't in the Lambda function. This is where within my CLI, and I'm going to be importing the client to talk via the Lambda uh, API. You know, V3, I'm going to do that. Pick my region. I've then got some paginators. I mean, you can imagine you would be doing this with an SDK or via a front end or that kind of thing. And I'm going to uh, catch the errors. Uh, if there are an error, sorry, that's a console log error. That's not the kind of thing. So I'm flicking through this code, uh, find a, um, where, where am I getting to? So here we go. <clears throat> so this is the SDK part that is going to invoke the, the, the stream uh, command. And this is going to literally then find the event stream. And each event is a chunk from the stream response. So this SDK call is, is going to look at the Lambda, Lambda API. And via this new Lambda API, Lambda is going to be sending a, uh, each event, which is a chunk. And I'm then going to await the, the stream uh, of events from this chunk. And if there are any errors, I'm going to be able to you know, decode any other kind of errors and show that show, show the payload, show the payload with the, with the normal errors. When um, there is any kind of error, I'm going to show the error code. And also, this is going to simulate as if the Lambda function timed out, and we're going to see what, what's happening. So we can see we run this a few times. Uh, you know, we're on the happy path, the midstream error, and then we show the timeout example. And this is just a you know an easy way that you could you know, simulate all these kind of things. So now running the client code uh, with the index.mjs, and the happy stream path streaming example is <laughs> is meant to be working. Is this not deploy? Oh, you see, here we go when we when we're doing our live coding, something has gone strange. Um, Pretty sure I have deploying. Let's just see. I've seen it is all pretty quick. Uh, I don't need a dash G. Let's just check if we can fix this because that's really annoying when you obviously haven't done enough um, uh, things to the demo god. So I'm going to do the sound deploy. Hopefully that's going to do. And what we will. Oh. Oh, I know what I've done. Um, I need to. Looks like my credentials have expired. So let me just assume the correct role to get that going. So this is the live live coding that happens. I'm trying to touch a security key at the same time. Taking some time. But anyway, while questions coming in, um, we'll do a question while we do that. Aravind uh, VC Cyber US said, what are the limitations in terms of throughput per second and cost benefits by using streaming with other services? Matthew, are you able to handle the 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 network throughput and the well, maybe yeah. some cost benefits too? There is a network throughput limit. Um, it, right now, it's two megabytes a second, and um, I'll try to be like transparent with this. Like we're starting there. Uh, I don't think it necessarily will always be two megabytes a second. And if you have a use case where you need it higher, then reach out to us, um, and it's it's something that we can kind of work through. Um, but right now, it's there, and it's there to you know make sure that. Um, that it, it's not abused in some way, right? So it's kind of like a safety uh, net that's there. Um, the, the benefits using stream with other services, cost benefits, um, I don't know, I gotta think about it. Like I definitely could think about the uh, cost benefit of Lambda uh, itself, like how it could be more cost effective. Um, but I don't know, Julian, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I can't think of anything 
specific. Um, other than, you know, even just mentioning the function URLs again, you know, not if you specifically for internal microservices, if you, you know, not having to use API Gateway, API Gateway has got amazing functionality and, you know, really feature rich API product. But sometimes you just don't need that. And so, you know, even though that's not streaming, <clears throat> maybe you are using streaming and that does unblock some kind of use case. Um, that's the kind of thing. In fact, Matthew, did you want to just touch on actually the the, the pricing dimension for this? Because there is a, an additional pricing element which we haven't mentioned. Yeah, there is. And I think there was a question earlier about it. So I'm glad we're getting to it. Um, right, like before Response Stream was released, I think I mentioned there's a six megabyte payload limit. And so even when you switch to Response Streaming, as long as you stay under that six megabyte limit, there's no extra charge. And we did that intentionally. We didn't want you to feel like penalized for switching to response streaming. Hey, I used to get a six megabyte response for free and now I don't. Um, so regardless of the number of requests you make, um, if they're six megabytes or under, you never get charged for it. So I'll, I'll just say that up front. Um, beyond that six megabytes per invoke, uh, you are charged a rate per processed gigabyte. And it does depend on the region. I think um, the baseline is like 0 0.008 cents per gigabyte process. So it's uh, it's not very much. It's sort of a nominal fee, um, you know, and, and that's there. Um, it, it's not intended to, to be very high. It's intended to be pretty low and manageable. And um, so there is a cost, but uh, in many cases, you'll never hit it. Uh, you also get 100 gigabytes free every month beyond that six. So everything under six is always free. Beyond that, you get charged, but even the first 100 gigabytes of that um, are free every month. So it's a, it's a pretty generous free tier and I think a pretty nominal cost beyond that. Yeah, and I've put that in the so on the screen in the, the Lambda pricing information has been updated uh, on all of this. Um, uh, Drill Lil, am I allowed to ask AWS beginner level questions? Of course, there are no questions uh, that, that aren't allowed. So yeah, please hit us up with your questions. I have managed to get my um, uh, credentials working. I don't think it was to do with Sam. I think I just, well, of course, you're going to do a live stream. We've been working on this all day, and then the, the credentials time out just at the wrong time. So remember, we were looking at the this um, index.mjs, which was going to show us all that our different um, errors and not. So I'm just running this client's application. I've got the happy path streaming example. And here you can see the sort of individual chunks coming through. And you can see that's you know, very, very clearly being read. Um, then I, OK, it's flick past. So let me just go up. You can now see I have detected an, uh, an error message. So this was within the Lambda function. We did say, I think, when we got to number payload chunk number four, you know, this is a custom error midstream. And you can see my SDK client has, uh, has picked that up, um, uh, has even picked, you know, even knows the line that's happening, so that's really uh, really useful, and also has the log result, which will be you know base sixty four encoded. You could have a look at that, um, and then as we carry on, there should have been a uh, timeout. Am I not missing it? Custom error midstream. Got a connection aborted. I'm pretty sure it's meant to. I'm pretty sure it normally says <clears throat> um, a timeout response. Maybe that hasn't happened, but yeah. Anyway, normally the demo, the demo at the end says has a timeout response, and you I can saw see. It. Did you past. see it? Okay, it was I'm... in there. Timeout example. See somewhere over there. Okay, not spotting it. Anyway, I promise you it is there. And if Matthew saw it, then I'm I'm going with his <laughs> I'm going with his, his his BDIs. So yeah, so this is really uh, you know I've posted up that uh, that example which is on on GitHub already. So yeah, if you wanted to use the SDK, you know there's a whole fully uh, uh, full Lambda function. Uh, which shows you how to generate the errors and then also how you can you know look at those in the SDK and uh, and decide what you're going to do. Yeah. So hopefully that well, has been uh, useful. Yeah, Matthew, what else do do we need to cover? What have we missed I'll out? Just on? jump in for a second, and, like give Please a high do. level, Julian, of like why you're showing this. Um, I think there, if if you hadn't showed this, I would expect a question to be like, hey, what if there's an error? Um, yeah. Does it <laughs> does the invoker get interrupted? How do I handle it? Like, what's the end user experience if something goes wrong? And what we want to show you here is we're giving you the tools to decide uh, yeah. how it's handled. So um, obviously you can stream content back, but also you can tell the invoker if there was an error. You can tell what kind of error it was. You can give metadata about it. And since you're in many cases, writing the code on the client side for your application, you can decide how that's handled, right? You, you can show the error um, to the end user. You can try to recover gracefully or retry or 
you know, whatever. Um, but you've, you've really got all of the tools, both on the function handler side and on the client side um, to create whatever experience you'd like. And that's what these examples are, are helping you with. And you can do some copy pasta to, to get started. Yeah. No, thanks for that. Oh, yeah. Much, much better explained. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, the idea is that, you know, this is hopefully a full rounded solution, you know, that you're going to have the info you need to be able to you know, look at it from both ends and be able to source stuff out here. You're not, you're not going to just be left hanging on the client side going, oh, timeout error, not being able to do it. You could see, you know, uh, literally coming all the way through the SDK call is the, you know, the, the custom error message and uh, some logs which you'll be able to use. Yeah, I didn't actually show, but uh, Sam Local Invoke also works with streaming, so you're able to uh, to be able to at least uh, test your functions out and see how they all kind of work as well. Matthew, what else have we missed, or or else would you like to add? Um, I think we've done. This has been pretty good, pretty thorough. I mean, I'll I'll answer uh, one more question on here from True Mud Drag, <laughs> um, ETA for Python. It's you know on a live stream asking a PM. For a delivery date for a feature. <laughs> well, no that's pressure. Key. Yeah. Um, so I can't give you an exact ETA, but I can tell you I think it's going to be the next one based on the kind of demand that we're seeing. Um, and we are definitely looking to expand mm -hmm. runtime support for this. Um, and uh, Julian, not to put you on the spot, I'd love to write a blog post with you to show people a little more in depth. How do you do this with custom runtimes? What's an example? Like we've seen people, and this is in our public GitHub issues already do this for Go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we know that you can use it for Python right now if you're using Lambda Web Adapter. So um, I think we can kind of follow on in short order with examples of how to unblock you in other runtimes, even without like official, you know, runtime yeah. features built into the, the managed runtimes. Yeah, because yeah, with a custom runtime, you can do anything. I mean, P I keep telling people like, don't be, you know, concerned with a custom runtime. You know, it's actually, under the hood, it's actually really simple. It's literally in a, uh, it's literally a loop that goes round and round, and you just wait things, for, uh, you know, waiting for things from an API. It's actually really easy to code, uh, really easy to code for. So yeah, <clears throat> we'll try and get our, our, out some more uh, sample uh, examples as well. So before we wrap up, just to remind you about the AWS Innovation Day, May the 17th, lots of great talks all, all about uh, serverless uh, containers, compute, event-driven architectures, and all different kind of things uh, on the wrong screen. And next week, we're talking to the amazing Alan Helton. He's a, a serverless hero of well-renowned, and he is going to be talking about automating your life with serverless. And he's built a number of different cool little hacky, quirky, fun projects to be able to um, uh, automate his life. And he'd love to share them with you so you can maybe spark some interest in uh, using serverless for more. And this isn't just necessarily IT automation uh, things, but some cool automation things. So I'll let him uh, uh, talk about it to you. Of course, we have spoken about serverlessland.com. Um, this is a super helpful resource on all things to do with serverless on AWS. <clears throat> From the front page, building event-driven architectures. Um, we uh, Some new guides are going to be coming out shortly, which is going to be super useful. I'm not going to tease too much what they're going to be, but they're certainly going to be able to help you um, uh, in using different kind of uh, applications and, you know, porting some kind of things and maybe some doing some testing. Uh, that could be in interesting. Testing is always, uh, you know, something that uh, people are working uh, hard on on serverless, spe specifically with async. So we're hoping for some more guides with that, info with that. And of course, patterns, workflows, snippets, and repos, you know, as much code as we can help you to get building serverless applications, be that Lambda or, or, or other services, a really great resource. The, the, the searching and the filtering has been updated recently as well, so it should all be easier, uh, easier to find. All the uh, samples from today are also in the serverless patterns collection, so really useful. But other than that, uh, Matthew, thanks so much for joining us. Seven months in, and you have a feature release out already, which is uh, awesome and brilliant. Um, so yeah, congratulations on that. It's been super Thank cool you. working with us. And thanks so much for joining us on the live stream and teaching us about Lambda response streaming. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So same time, same place. We'll be listening to Alan Helton. But thanks for joining us uh, this week. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, uh, get in contact.